Okay, so finally we're going to talk about the most effective and ethical ways of doing evaluation. Um, because at the core of all of this program evaluation stuff that we've been talking about throughout the semester is a really sticky, tricky ethical dilemma. And that is this here, that all of the social programs that we care about are designed to help people. That's the whole point of doing any sort of social program. You want to fix poverty. You want to fix discrimination. You want to fix um, education and improve education. You want to do things that make people better off. Um, the only way to make sure that it's working is you have to have some people not use the program um, because you need a control group in order to evaluate the program. Um, so for the sake of science and for the sake of causal inference, you need people to not use programs that will help them. And that is the tricky ethical dilemma of all of this um, because you basically have to say to people, don't undergo this program to improve your situation and lift yourself out of poverty for the sake of science, which you can't do that. Um, the World Bank had this quote in the readings that you had for today. Um, that basically groups should not be excluded from any intervention that is known to be beneficial solely for the purpose of an evaluation or solely for the purpose of science. So we've been joking throughout the semester that like there's no randomized controlled trial for smoking because you would have to basically assign people to smoke for 40 years for the sake of science, and that seems unethical. Um, but that's also the same situation here. You have to basically say you cannot use Medicaid for the sake of science that's wrong. You can't do that. Um, and so what you have to focus on when you're doing this type of evaluation is you need a control group, but that control group needs to be ethically chosen. Um, you can't purposely exclude people that could benefit from a program. Um, that's another reason why this chart here um, from chapter 11 of the World Bank reading is really helpful. Not only does it tell you how to choose which type of evaluation based on demand for a program and when it's being rolled out, this does give some ethical guidance to how to do this. For instance, if you know that the program is being rolled out over time, then it's fine to do a randomized control trial. You're withholding the program from some people but that's because there aren't enough resources for it to get to everybody yet. And so inevitably, some people will be left out. And so you can do a lottery system. You can randomly assign people to it because eventually they will be able to get it. If you don't, if there's limited resources and it will never be rolled out to everybody and it's only being rolled out to a few people, that's where it gets a little bit ethically trickier um, because then some people will be helped and some people will never, ever have the opportunity to be helped by the program. And that's not necessarily great. And so the focus here is you want to have some sort of phased implementation over time. Um, so everybody will eventually get the chance to use the program. Um, and so again, like the, the cool thing about this is it takes that into account um, and helps you with kind of ethical guidance as you're choosing how to roll out the program and how to evaluate the program as it's being rolled out. Um, other things you need to, to consider as you're doing evaluation um, from the, the reading in chapter 12 here is that you generally want to follow what are called institutional, re institutional review board guidelines. Um, if you've ever done any sort of human-based research, um, either if you're a PhD student, you've probably done this. Um, if you're a master's student, you may have done this, depending on if you've done projects with people. Um, universities require you to go through training and certification with the Institutional Review Board. And every university and research institution has one of these boards. It's made up of a whole bunch of researchers that evaluate proposals for researching humans um, and checking to see if they are ethically done um, and ethically proposed. So IRB guidelines generally follow these three categories here, where you care about having respect for persons, um, meaning you respect people's humanity. You don't lie to them. You don't trick them. You don't deceive them. Um, you make sure that they give informed consent um, so that they can exercise autonomy. If they want to leave the program and become attritters, cool. They should be able to do that. They should not be locked into the program permanently, especially if there's potential for harm. And so you want to be able to focus on that. 
Um, this principle of beneficence here, this is the idea that you should have no harm, or if there is potential for harm, you want to minimize the potential harm to participants and maximize the potential benefits. So any participant in an evaluation needs to um, basically be taken care of and maximize their benefits and minimize potential harm. So you're not going to purposely expose them to harmful things for the sake of science. You want to minimize that harm. So don't lie to them, don't deceive them, don't harm them. Um, and then the justice principle here is the idea that the benefits and the burdens of research are fairly and equitably shared. Um, so this means not necessarily like overusing the same group of people for experiments. This often happens. This is one of the, the criticisms for JPAL is that um, it's easy to go to the developing world um, and run a whole bunch of RCTs on villages in Kenya and Uganda and Bolivia and other places because they're there. Um, and because there's lots of funding from Western universities to go to places in the global south and subject them to experiments. Um, don't necessarily need to do that um, because there, the benefits and the burdens of the research aren't necessarily shared equally by everybody. Um, this also applies to who is doing the research. Um, if you are working in the global south, it is important to work with researchers who also are from the global south. If you're going to do some sort of um, experiment for a mosquito net program or something in Malawi, um, you don't want to just fly in and drop in and do your experiment and leave um, because you're putting the whole burden of the evaluation on basically your target population. Um, you should work with Malawian professors and people who are on the ground, NGO workers, um, community leaders, get their input and share kind of the burden of the research design and the burden of the research analysis with the target population, get them involved in, in the process as well. Um, and that's kind of a more ethical and, and better way of approaching this type of stuff when you're doing any sort of evaluation. Um, another thing you should focus on is privacy. Um, you want to make sure that the people who are participating don't have their um, private information exposed to the world, um, especially when there's so much emphasis on sharing data. Um, I'm making you share your data. You're generating fake data, um, but then you're turning in a CSV file of that, of that fake data. But also, in theory, if you're doing this in real life later on, you should share the data that you collect so that other people can run that same analysis. The issue with that, though, is you don't want to share identifiable information. Um, you don't want somebody later to go find one of the participants in your program and track them down and ask them about their, their experience, especially if you're working with vulnerable populations. If you're doing some sort of domestic violence prevention program or an after-divorce um, intervention program or something, you definitely don't want those participants to be found and to be de-identified. Um, because then that poses real risk and danger to them and it breaks the beneficence principle there. Um, you don't want to do that. And so you want to de-identify the information as much as possible so that people cannot be tracked later on. Um, so you can also um, apply ethical principles to the actual analysis of the data and the analysis of the evaluation. And this was also a part of the reading that you had. And it's also why I'm having you do the final project the way I'm having you do it. Um, here, um, there are specific best practices that you can follow that prevent kind of statistical malfeasance. Um, we've talked about p-hacking before, um, where you basically throw in a whole bunch of different control variables until you find a p-value that you like, and then there's your effect. And then you write your report as if you had chosen those from the beginning. So pre-registration basically says, here are my hypotheses, here's what I'm going to do to analyze the data, and you post that on the internet, and then you go do it, and then if it doesn't work, oh well, um, it means it didn't work, and you're not going to p-hack your way around it and make it work. Um, it also creates or prevents this thing called the file drawer problem, which is similar. Like if you can't p-hack your way out of a thing, then you just kind of file the question away forever and never answer it, um, which means nobody will ever know the answer. And if it's a null answer where the program doesn't have an effect, nobody's going to know that. And then everybody's going to keep doing the same program, even though there's evidence that it doesn't work, but nobody's showing that evidence because they're just kind of hiding it. So when you pre-register, 
an analysis. You're basically saying, this is what I think is going to happen. I'm posting it on the internet for everybody to see. Now I'm going to go do it. The pre-analysis plan is the same idea. Um, this is just more specific, generally with code, where you say, here are all of the exact models I'm going to run. Here are all the variables I'm going to create. I'm going to create an index of these four variables, and this is what I'm going to do to create it. And you basically outline the entire analysis, um, and this is why you use fake data. Um, before you actually go out and collect the data, you kind of invent fake data just as a placeholder so that you can make sure all of the plumbing of your models works, um, that you can combine the columns that you need to, that you can do everything you need to to make this work. Um, and then you also post that and say, here's what I'm going to do to analyze my data. Um, the other best practices that we have here are replication and documentation. The nice thing about replication, like the whole goal of replication is that somebody else can take your data, they can take your pre-analysis plan, and they can run your script and get the same results. So anybody can, can find the same numbers you do. The reason I'm having you do an R markdown file instead of just a script off to the side that generates a whole bunch of tables that you then put into Word yourself is that that is kind of the height of replication, of replicability, where you can just knit the document and it reruns all of the analysis and spits all the numbers into the document and you're done. Um, and so anybody can install R on their computer, install the packages they need, click on knit, and they replicate your project, which is really cool. Um, and then from the documentation side, that's also why I'm having you do our markdown is um, it, cl it clearly lays out each of the steps you're doing. Everything is very well documented. Um, you should comment your code. You should make it um, easy to follow. Um, if you're collecting data, you should have some sort of code book that explains what all of the different variables are. There are good best practices to follow with documentation here. And so you should focus on these things when you're doing analysis, not just because it's good statistical best practice, but because it improves science and it creates more ethical findings. Um, this table here from chapter 13 of, of your reading kind of summarizes all of, all of that that I had on the previous slide here where you want trial registries, you want pre-analysis plans, you want documentation because um, it fixes all of these other issues like data mining and p-hacking and things like that. So that's why I'm having you do this. It feels weird. It feels excessive, potentially. Um, it especially feels weird because I'm basically saying make fake data to be an ethical researcher, which feels dangerous. Like, you don't want to fake your data. Um, but it does help with best open science practices um, because you essentially create a good pre-analysis plan that has simulated placeholder data in it. You will not make any causal claims using your simulated data. That would be wrong. Um, but it kind of makes sure all of the plumbing of your research is working. And you say, these are all of the things I'm going to do. You basically do all of the statistical shenanigans, all of the p-hacking, everything that you want to do. You do it on the fake data, make it so that you have the ideal model, and then plug in the real data. Don't go back and mess with this stuff because you've already kind of set it in stone with the pre-analysis plan and then stick the real data in and see what happens. Um, so fake data in this situation, or synthetic data, to make it sound less onerous or less ominous, um, is very helpful, good scientific practice. And so that's why I'm having you do this. So keep that in mind as you're working on your problem set, because you will get frustrated and you'll be like, why am I inventing data? This is so dumb. It's, it's a long process, but it is very, very valuable and very, very useful and best practice for this type of analysis and this type of evaluation. So that's why I'm having you do it. Um, and it should be fun. So go ahead and go over to the guides if you haven't looked at them for generating random numbers and generating synthetic data. Um, and then once you're done with those guides, use those to help you with problem set nine and good luck.